You're listening to the Write Project Podcast and Radio Program, a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR-FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew. Welcome to a very special episode of the Right Project Podcast. Today, we've got a host of authors on to answer one of the most frequent questions that's asked of any author. We're asking them, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? And today to answer, we have on Tracy Waddleton, who is from Trapassi, Newfoundland. She recently just put out a book through Breakwater Books called Send More Tourists, The Last Ones Were Delicious. Tracy Waddleton, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? An early experience where I learned that language had power. Well, I mean, I I was a reader from a very young child. Um, I was an only child, and my mother got me a library card when I was four or five years old. And I would literally be coming out of the library with um, a stack of books over my head, like dropping them all over the pavement. I mean, that was a common thing about once a week. And I think that I'm not sure if we're talking about literature or words having power on um, in a public way, but for me privately, they were like friends when I was a kid. I was, you know, I could go out and play with my little friends until five or six in the evening, and then I had to be home for supper, and then I was alone all evening with these great adventurers and, you know, Alice in Wonderland and and things like that. So if we're talking about words having power and that they are company and friends and teachers and um, can show you the world, then I guess I, I learned that quite young just from having access to a lot of books. Uh, thankfully, my parents had read and um magazine somewhere that you're supposed to read to your kids and that was really important to them and um, I think through doing that they gave me you know little friends to grow up with on those lonely only child evenings that taught me a great deal about the world okay no that's great um have you ever seen the movie Matilda that a stupid answer no that was a wonderful answer (laughs) have you ever seen the movie Matilda Yes, I think I did see it at, at some point. Yes, because I'm picturing, like, retention. you know, this child, like, going home and reading the books from the library and being like, these are my friends, and I'm like, this is sweet. This is like, I have to go rewatch Matilda now. Yeah, well, now I'm going to have to watch it again, too, because <laughs> you're making me wonder if it's, like, mirroring my own situation. Well, she also gets telekinetic powers, I think, from reading the books, so not quite. Oh, well, that happened to me, too, so oh, okay. there you go. There yeah. you go. That makes sense. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm joking. Are you? I am. Okay. All right. Am I? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've reached the point where we get silly. Perfect. Um, thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Jamie Thomas, the author of Asperfell, a gothic fantasy YA adult crossover novel novel that Publishers Weekly said had tremendous crossover appeal. Um, Jamie Thomas, uh, what was an early experience you had where you learned that language had power? Oh, goodness. What a great question. Um, Oh, this is such a huge theme of this book. Um, so, do you mind if I talk, talk instead about, about Yeah, do you mind if I talk instead about how that actually led to me writing this book? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, so, um, words themselves uh, and a voice uh, have such an incredible power, uh, and you might not really realize it. So, when I started... Um, envisioning this book obviously that component kind of hadn't come into it yet like I said I was trying to tell this very um kind of the trope of a prince rescuing a helpless maiden from a tower but subverted the other way and this tower being this haunted gothic magical prison very small in scope Brian kind of screwed all that up because when when I she was fully formed as a character and had this voice um 
it came around at a time in which um, I was very, very angry. This was about, I don't know, 2017, I want to say. And um, Why were you angry? <laughs> so I don't I was... know. That's funny. I know a lot of people here who were angry around 2017. Oh, whatever for. Especially as a woman. And I... so I was sitting in my ki- in my parents' kitchen, actually, because I was over for Sunday dinner. Uh, my parents live in the same hometown um, in Wenatchee. And so um, we were over there and I was drinking wine and in the kitchen and I was supposed to be studying. And I was on... Twitter, the dumpster fire, and I was just getting so worked up. Some, I can't even remember what it was that would happen. It might have been Charlottesville at the time. I'm not sure. I don't think so because this was in November, but I was just getting so worked up, and the problem with getting worked up at that point was feeling so incredibly helpless, feeling like, okay, I am one person in this vast nation. I have no power. All I have is my voice, and I can exercise that voice at the ballot box, but you just you feel so incredibly helpless, like your one voice uh, can't do anything, um, has no power, uh, and, and us women especially feel this um, quite acutely and, and did then and still do now. Mm. And that idea for Asperfeld and for Bryony that had been kind of tumbling around inside my head uh, came out that night um, out of anger, I will say, um, but well-placed anger. And I think the first thousand, two thousand words of her story just kind of poured out of me. Um, because Bryony uh, is, her story is uh, that of a woman discovering the power in her own voice. And that's actually what I dedicated this book to, was for every woman who has yet to discover the power in her own voice. And uh, it, we may not think we can do much with that. We may not think that our voices matter or can make a difference, but there is power in them. There really, really is. And one person can make even a small difference and that can cascade. And, and so um, for me, it was about words and um and uh, language and a voice having the power to make a difference and if um i was reading the early reviews um and i remember emailing my publisher and telling him i was crying reading one because uh one of these reviews was from a woman who said that she wished that she'd had this book as a teenager and um and the lessons from from this book and it just really uh it was like ugly crying at that point because if it reached one person and made a difference in that way, then yes, the voice has power. And so um, I often tell my students that knowledge is the most powerful tool a person can possess. But also along with that is is your voice. And um, so Bryony's magic, she is an orare, is literally the ability to communicate with and speak to magic. So it is uh, both metaphorical and literal in this book, uh, finding that power in your voice. I like that. That's awesome. Uh-huh. That sounds, I'm, I, I already had it bought, but now I'm looking forward to reading it. Because <laughs> this will shock you, oh, but yeah. sometimes I books uh, for 99 cents, and I'm like, yeah, it's not getting read, but now I'm going to read that. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm glad. Thank you very much. Next up, we have B.C. Labeled, the Canadian independent author of the 10th Lunan Regiment series, a military sci-fi saga. He also writes an immersive dark fantasy series. His current titles include To Drown in Sand, Juris Lunance, To Drown in Ash, The Dog, Bone, and Upon a Wake of Flame. B.C. Labeled, what is an early experience where you learned that language has power? Um... The first time I heard anybody quote my character, and it's happened a couple times since, but um, understand that moment where you understand that the people who talk to you in your head that you type out their words, somebody else read that intercourse, read that discourse, read that moment, and brought it back to you and told you what it did for them. That was the first moment I thought, okay, that's why I do this. It's sharing a slice of your psyche in a way that resonates with someone else. And and it's in the form of language. So they bring these words back to you and they're like, Hey, when this character said X, um, that, that, really hit me hard or I cried or that changed the way I looked at things or I didn't realize the plot was going to go that way. Um, that's that's the biggest payoff in terms of how language is power to me. Excellent. 
Excellent. I agree. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Lorelana Dunn, the superstar short story author who recently put out her first full novel, Ashes, which came out in June 2020 from Engine Books. Lorelana Dunn, what was an early experience you had where you learned that language can have power? Hmm. Going to have to say working in customer service. Really? That's an interesting yeah. answer. Do elaborate. Well, most people, maybe that's a generalization, but a lot of people, their first jobs are in customer service, and usually they're teenage aged, I guess. So if you're dealing with the public and they are upset and you use the incorrect word, you're going to figure that out very quickly. Yes. Yes. I remember that, yes. Right, yeah. So I think learning to navigate language correctly is a skill set that is important for for people. Um, I know here in Newfoundland, it's it's very interesting because we have so many different dialects and meanings to different words. And then when we move away to live in places where they speak more so what I'll call the Queen's English, there's a bit of a barrier there at times. It's, uh, it's very interesting to see the way that language is perceived or words are used in different scenarios, which is hard to take into writing to carry it over. I think that might have been one of my bigger struggles. I, I once made a quip where I said, I'm expected to use the Queen's English, but I grew up speaking New Finese, so there's a, a bit of a disconnect if you've never really studied different things like, um, oh, I don't know, proper punctuation or grammar or conjugation, I guess, for when you're changing words for different tenses. Yeah. And I, I, I think I, I struggle with that a bit more than a lot of people because I haven't really done a lot of formal training in that. I kind of just write what I know from reading and speaking, which I think is, is pretty um, popular. Yeah. And a lot of people do it. So I guess really the short answer for that long answer is that it's, it's still an ongoing learning experience because language is A, ever evolving, but B, is so different to so many different people. There's a lot of nuances to it. Wonderful. Thank you. And God bless editors. Yes, yes. Editors yeah. are wonderful, wonderful human beings. Absolutely, yeah. There is an interesting dynamic there of when it is and isn't appropriate to write in your native accent or your native tongue. Like, you are a Newfoundland author. Uh, you're writing for a publishing company set in Newfoundland. What would be the problem if your book like, had the cadence of Newfoundland speech, exactly. You, you know what I mean? Like, I, I always kind of... It took me a long time to to come around to that. Like, I would, I would get earlier drafts, earlier publications of my early stuff. I would get a lot of flack for writing as I spoke. Uh, I eventually changed it, but there, there's a little part of me that's still like... No, oh, like... like British authors don't get any flack, like you said, with the Queen's English for writing as they speak. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And we have turns of phrase here that um, it's said outside of the context of this province or, you know, who you're speaking with sound incredibly offensive when here it's, it's not meant that way. So there's a, a very interesting, I guess, kind of a line of political correctness that you need as well and that you need to be aware of as well so you don't alienate people yeah yeah i i know some of the ones you're talking about yeah absolutely thank you very much next up we have tasha madison the author of fabric of a generation tasha madison uh can you recount an early experience in which you learned that language had power mm, yes I think one of the books that I read as a child uh, was called My Name is Asher Lev by Kane Potok. Um, and in the book, it talks about how this this guy who's Jewish, he's an artist, and he really struggles with maintaining his faith without, you know, while also staying true to his artistry. 
Um, and it's a very complicated, beautiful tale um, that is also somewhat sad. Um, but I think that really helped me to see the power that words on a page truly have. Language has the ability to be able to transcend you not only to another place, almost a different dimension, um, if you will, because it really allows you to reimagine what the author is saying and to really put yourself in that character's shoes. Um, and I think storytelling is a very beautiful thing and it's, it's an art. I think it's a, truly an art. Um, and so I think language has great power um, when it allows you to truly get lost in the story and put yourself in the character's shoes. Absolutely. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Next up, we have the author of Alligator and February, Lisa Moore. Lisa Moore, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, that is such a good question. Um, well, uh, I, w when I was, uh, so one of the first times I realized that language had power, I was in about grade six, I would say. Or maybe it was even younger than that. Maybe it was in grade five. And I was, maybe it was even in grade four. And I had been reading a novel, and it was one of those novels that came from Scholastic, because, you know, they would pass around the paper flyer in, in school, and you could tick, tick off the books that you wanted if you were allowed to get them. And um, anyways, I had this book, and I had read it. And I went to school... And at recess, I started to tell the story, the plot of the novel, to some kids that had gathered around my desk. And I became so involved in telling the story that I, I just realized that every, soon everybody in the whole class had gathered around my desk to hear what the plot was. Now, this wasn't a story I had written, but I could see that they were... Um, completely enraptured with the story and um and i realized wow that's what storytelling can do i it wasn't my story but i i could see the just the hunger to hear what was going to happen next uh that was that people were feeling and how they had pressed together and i think that was like the first time i i really realized that th this was a potent um and entertaining and magical thing that a person could do they could tell a story and and i i think it was after that that i started to realize gee maybe i could do my own stories excellent excellent that's that's wonderful i also remember scholastic that was like i used to just read through the scholastic magazine like dreaming about the books i might be able to get someday me too yeah thank you very much Next on the line, we have Amanda Labonte, author of the Call of the Sea and Supernatural Causes series. Uh, Amanda, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Um, wow, that's a deep question. <laughs> um... Well, obviously now people know we don't get these ahead of time. Yeah. Um, language had power. I feel like this should be something like super deep. I, for me, it's the and first it's like time pivotal. I said the word. I can't say oh. that on the air. I can't. I can't really. Right, right. It's going to be cut out. But for me, it's the first time I cursed as a child and watched the whole like whole room just stop. And I was like, uh -huh. oh, well, that's that's interesting. Um, wow, I think, I mean, probably as a child, um, you know what, I went to Catholic school, and I went to, like, really strict Catholic school, so I think my, my familiar, like, with language and words comes, we spent a lot of time on religious studies, and just things like, um, we always had to capitalize God. Okay. And... Yeah, in, in our writing, um, whether it was, like, religious writing or non-religious writing or creative writing. And from a young age, like, that was, that's a thing that, that was required in our, and it was, like, fixed or wrong if, if we didn't do it properly, um, according to the teachers, and, and many of them were nuns. And it was just this idea that, like, um, I guess a lot of the meaning around words that I kind of was exposed to early on came from, like, a religious slant. Yeah. 
Um, and then that kind of stuck with me because I studied philosophy in university and all um, philosophy is, like, not all it is, but a big part of it is looking at, um, like, in, in philosophy, you're not allowed to, to define a word by using the word in the definition. So you have, to, you have to actually, like, when you're using a word, you actually have to think about what it means and why you're using it. Um, and we were also prevented from using the word this. I had a professor that would uh, take off marks if we put this in, a, in an essay. You had to restate exactly what your thought was. You couldn't, like, fudge through it. Hmm. Okay. Like, two plus two is four. This means that, like, whatever. Like, you can't, you couldn't, you're, you couldn't have a sentence start with this. That is you very interesting. You had to, you had to be very specific with your language. Yeah, the whole you can't use a word to define itself. That That is, that's not just philosophy. I mean, that's, like, if you go through I mean, a dictionary, they don't they, use. Well, they argue that philosophy created that concept and that's why dictionaries use it now but that's i mean that's going back but philosophers often try and take um credit for everything which is why i loved it so much yeah. um but it's the the idea of every word you use has to have meaning and that's it's and i mean a lot of philosophy too like um until more recently came from had that um grounding in religion and in christian religion and so i think a lot of that kind of crossed over. But I think, yeah, I think um, having to understand uh, the meaning behind prayers and the meaning behind, like, because it was, I mean, because this, this idea of, like, you learn a prayer when you're really young and you just recite it. And then, as like, I remember being in school and having to, like, take it apart and look at, like, why? Because so much of prayer is repetition and... Um, and the use of words that way, I think that's probably, I mean, obviously swearing, like, as a young age, you always, you always kind of understand that, like, oh, that's, that definitely had an impact, um, but, uh, but yeah, other, like, that, other than that, like, as a kid, like, really understanding that, like, my words had meaning was, was probably in that, that Catholic school setting. That's interesting. Actually, that um, that capital G is one of the only things that uh, one of the rare things that my editor constantly marks that I constantly ignore. Uh, I use the capital. It's always a hint if the character believes it. So yep. if the character believes, then it's a capital G. And if the character doesn't believe or has doubts, it's a lowercase g. And it's something I never draw attention to. It's just something I. It's not even really thematic. It's just something I put in the back of my head. Like, that's how you do it. And every time my editor will correct... She's very religious. She'll correct them all to a capital G, and I'll go back and right. go, no, no, no. Right. Yeah, I mean, I guess, too, it depends. Like, is God, like, a, an abstract concept? and Or is it, like, something that you actually believe in and that makes a huge difference? But obviously I was coming from an environment of... Uh, I, was, I was surrounded by inherent believers like yes yes my, my school was attached to a convent so yes Fair. which was attached to a church so yeah Fair. thank you very much next up we have morgan murray author currently he has the book dirty birds with breakwater book morgan murray you're very good with language and i seem to be very careful with your words what's an early experience you had where you learned that language had power um early uh language having power um probably the earliest is my mom always used to read to us okay. and in the we used to live in like a trailer when we were really small and me and my brother and sister are all like within three years of each other so uh the, just the configuration of the house was my mom would sit in the hallway outside my brother in my room and my sister's room doors so we could both all hear her and she'd read us you know all kinds of different books um and to this day if my mom starts reading out loud i like fall asleep immediately yeah <laughs> so just the 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 sound of her voice and the books she read and i couldn't like what are some of the books she read like my side of the mountain. Did you ever come I across have. that book? I love that one. Yeah, which is a really cool book, and I wanted to like run away and live on a mountain by myself. Um, 
but just all these like sort of semi-classic kids books and and uh things like that and but just the sound of her voice and, and these stories would just like wash over you and make you feel as calm and relaxed as possible and i'd you know never have slept as well as then but even when she like read my mail on the phone i'll like pass sleep or something so um that was kind of the my introduction into that stories can do something and, and our house was full of dr seuss too and she would read when we we're really small would read a lot of dr seuss and dr seuss would always get me like excited because the just the cadence of the words and the sounds and the rhymes and everything so just really early on i learned that words can do things which was pretty cool I love Dr. Seuss because he and uh, and Shakespeare and a few others that that were made up words very well is yeah. kind of my defense because sometimes I will in my fiction make up words and very pedantic people will be like that's not a word I'm like no it is now I used it see there it is use it in a sentence there you go yeah yeah and, and often it's just like smashing two things together like verisimilitude and ooh, how do I describe like the verisimilitudinousness of it you know what I mean like that's not a word but you know how it is you know those people will be shocked to find out that the characters in your books also don't exist and were made up or that all words are made up there you go yeah just depends on how long ago thank you very much Next on the line, we have Nicole Little. Nicole Little is an acclaimed short story author who has been featured in more than a half dozen titles just in the last year. She has been featured in Kitsora, The Autobiography, best-selling Dystopia from the Rock, Flights from the Rock, Monsters, Beyond, and Apocalypse, Apocalypse, Eerie Christmas, Love, and Bad Romance. It's just a plethora of short story material. Currently, she is working on The Lotus Fountain, which is going to be one of the books included in, or novellas included in a big project from Engine Books that we can talk about now called Slipstreamers. Nicole Little, what was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh my goodness. Well, um, as I've mentioned before, I um, did public speaking competitions when I was, oh, I guess junior high. Um, I, I get really nervous beforehand, but I, I really enjoy once I'm up there. It's something sort of, I guess, powerful about it, like grabbing all these people's attention and they're so focused on you. And you, um, yeah, they're just, all their attention's on you. They're focused on what you're saying. And something that you've written, that you've created, is able to to do that. Um, I can remember when I read um, at the Dystopia launch. Yep. And I'd been sitting in the front. So it wasn't until I stood up that I realized how many people were actually there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't realize there was, I think there was like, what, like 80 people? Yeah, more. And, it was, it was about oh, 120. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I hadn't realized there were that many there. I just thought there were, like, you know, like 50 or something, which would have been a lot anyways. And I can remember when I was reading that there was silence. Just absolute silence, like nobody made a sound. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so amazing, this feeling that what I have written has all these people just so quiet and they're all just looking at me. It was, it was really great. That's fun. Yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, I would once again like to thank Tracy Waddleton, Jamie Thomas, BC Labelt, Laura Lana Dunn, Tasha Madison, Lisa Moore, Amanda Labonte, Morgan Murray, and Nicole Little for coming on the Right Project podcast today and talking about their first experiences of discovering that language has power. That's always a very, very important moment for an author in their development. If you're an author and you're out there and you have thoughts on when you discovered that language has power, please call into the show. Please contact CHMR. We'd love to have you on the program. 
for all of you. We'll be here again next week at 4.30 Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.